Hello, I'm clarinetist James Tobin in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I'm here to play for you and discuss the Allstate Prepared Bass Clarinet Etude. So let's go ahead and listen to what it sounds like. Okay, so there's a number of things, challenging things for bass clarinets in this etude. And the very first thing right off the bat is you being able to deliver an honest dotted eighth sixteenth versus that triplet. So if your dotted eighth sixteenths become triplety, it, it's, it's, it's going to be difficult to get a good score. And so what I mean by that, let me play you the opening of this with, with triplety dotted eighth sixteenths. <laughs> So the dotted eight sixteenth really has to be a lot crisper than the triplet. And you have to maintain that throughout as needed. Um, another big factor is where the is where the composer and the judges have given you accents and non-accents. And although the dynamic is forte, one of the easiest ways to make sure that your dynamics, and that, excuse me, your accents are effective is to make sure that the non-accented notes are not, is not, is not as loud. It's a contrast issue. And in two really tempting places, uh, at the end of measure one and at the end of measure two, it's going to be real tempting to go ahead and accent the last eighth note of each measure as you're leaping up. And if it's the difference between the notes speaking or not, go for it. But if you can, you'd rather not accent the 16th and just accent the downbeat. <laughs> Additionally, where the composer has specifically uh, asked for staccato is the best place to use staccato. And then generally speaking, elsewhere, don't. Okay? Again, it's a contrast issue. Um, the C sharp in measure six, you really have two options. One is the legit option, which is fingered two, three, one, two. Okay, but on most bass clarinets, you have this pinhole right here on the top, and you need to slide your first finger down so that pinhole is activated. So this is down and the pinhole is open. Now on some bass clarinets this makes no difference and in other bass clarinets it makes all the difference in the world. So here is your first, your normal option. And that produces a much more resonant C sharp because more of the column of air is vibrating. But uh, another option, which I use all the time in symphony, is to simply use an overblown F-sharp throat tone. F-sharp isn't really a throat tone, but we're a half step away, it's close. Without the register key, you don't need it, okay? So this is just the first finger by itself covering the pinhole. When you compare the two, you'll hear that the, the first finger C-sharp speaks a lot more quickly and it is very bright, so you have to be careful with it. 
but finger-wise it's easier in this passage. And there's a legitimate argument that when you have a second register passage like this with one note in the third register, that you should use a second register fingering for that third register note. The same would be true if it was a first register passage with one note in the second register to use a first register fingering for that note if you can, if there's one available. We're down to a couple of, of, of last details here. I, I wanted to point out one really nice compositional aspect of the B section of this piece, which starts with the tempo change in measure nine. And that is there, there's a descending chromatic motif, which is very obvious. <laughs> But it continues. The first note of 11 is an F, the first note of 12 is an E, and then uh, the fifth note of 12 is an E flat. And that figure is actually repeated several measures later, and that's one of the reasons why I provided those notes so much emphasis. I wanted to continue making clear that chromatic descent. Um, as you may have noticed, there are no rests in this piece, so where do you breathe? Uh, the reality is we want to breathe, generally speaking, at phrase endings, and you're going to have to use your ear to figure out what you think is a complete thought and where is the appropriate place to breathe. There are obviously times when we have to make compromises, especially in a work that has no rests. So generally speaking, after longer notes, if we have a choice, um, definitely at phrase endings. But there are times in which you can take a breath for dramatic effect that not only increases the, the expression of the music, but also helps you solve a problem. For example, you all heard me take a breath at the end of measure 20 into 21, where there's no breath mark written and there's no rest to back it up. But I'll tell you what, from 21 on, you have a bunch of uh, decisions you have to make about where to breathe. And you're gonna have to take liberty somewhere. So, let me play 20 for you with a couple options about where to breathe and you can choose what you think is best for you, okay? One would be to take the breath before the last three sixteenth notes before measure 21. And in so doing, you can take momentum in those last three sixteenth notes into the downbeat of 21. I chose to go with the more dramatic effect of taking a breath in between the last 16th and the downbeat. Uh, that's just what pleases me more. Um, another interesting place in which we need to consider this is at the end of the piece and a couple of details that we had at the end of the piece. So at the end of measure 26, we clearly have a rallentando written over the third beat. And the way I would interpret it, all of 27 should be played in that rallentando tempo. The odd tempo at 28 is a bit tricky because changes in tempo are best communicated with moving notes and these are sustained notes and so I think for it to be effective it really needs a very purposeful crescendo or diminuendo to indicate the change in tempo. You could simply move that odd tempo back, uh, let's say into the last beat of 27. So I will play from the last beat of 26 to the end Another option would be to move the a tempo into measure 29. Again, it's going to be what appeals to you and what you think can help enhance the expression that you are providing the judges. I think the one last thing I'd want to talk about is to measure 25, because this is easily the hardest measure for me in the fact that the leaps down from the clarion B into the lower Chalumeau is a tricky, tricky pop, pop, proposition, excuse me. And as somebody who plays a ton of clarinet and quite a bit of bass, obviously my lower notes want to crack. They want to go up and, and break. <laughs> I solved that in two ways. One is I put, a, I put a breath at the end of measure 25, and if I'm going to put a breath at the end of measure 25, and I want to prepare the audience, I'm going to slow down a bit. And that gives me some time to account for those downward leaps. 
Additionally, as I'm playing each of those individual beats, I'm really thinking about lightly stopping the B with my tongue so that I can release the lower note. Um, and that's a technique that some of you may employ. Some of you might find that you have no issues with this. Uh, thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, you can email me at uh, tobinclarinet at gmail.com. And uh, I hope you all have a wonderful audition at the end of the month.